Right. Good to go, I believe. Um, if everybody could, um, good morning. Uh, I'm Lou Baxter, for those of you that don't know me. Um, if you could uh, mute your microphones, I do apologise. I have two dogs, so they might bark. Uh, and I obviously can't mute myself because I've got to speak. Um, the um, I'm going to hear this morning just to talk to you about um, the National Training Standards Scams Team and the well-being academic study that we did in relation to um, the call blocking project that was funded by the DCMS. So if anybody has a question, please just raise your hand or virtually raise your hand. Um, right, so for those of you who don't know, National Training Standards was set up in 2012, received uh, central government funding in 2014. Um, the call cool block blocking project was specifically funded by the DCMS initially in 2015, 16, um, and then we received some additional funding last financial year, um, a second tranche of funding to run a second call blocking project. So in total, I think we've issued uh, 3,200 call blockers in partnership with TrueCall. Um, right, so just a bit of a general, I'm not gonna go through every slide because the presentation will be available afterwards, I believe from Corinne. So there's lots of different um, things that we were looking to tackle the problem around nuisance calls and scam calls. So it's a, around, it's, it's a form of fraud. Um, and there's a lot of work that we do with central government and with the general public around trying to change those perceptions. They're not just nuisance calls. A lot of them are scam calls and there's a lot of um, grooming and befriending of the victims to extort additional money from these people. And actually the losses that we see are, are enormous, not just from a financial perspective, but also from an emotional and a wellbeing perspective to those, to those victims at the end of it. We've also seen more recently, um, and one of the documents that we've launched um, today is a document around behaviour change of the criminals. We've seen a lot of the criminals who were who were sending scam mail, so scam letters, are moving across to the telephone scams. And what they do is they will write to a victim initially, get their telephone number, and then those victims will be repeatedly targeted on the telephone. Uh, right, so the UK accounted for 15% of the total number of fraudulent calls blocked across the world in 2018, accounting for 25 million calls. It's estimated that between five to 10 billion pounds a year is lost by UK consumers. We think it's actually far greater than that. We think that's a, that's quite a low figure in relation to fraud and scams. The project timeline. So in relation to the call blocking project, um, applications went live on the Friends Against Scams website. Um, the the last, we had to shut it all down because of um, lockdown, because we weren't able to do installs. Um, but when we reopened it, which was very recently, all the 600 and I think it was 640 call blockers that we had um, all went within about four hours. So there is a there is a need for it. We have a waiting list. The general public want them. Um, the criteria is around people have to be, applicants have to be vulnerable because of their circumstances and they have to have received a scam call. So it's quite a simple process. I and mean, obviously we're relying on people to tell us the truth. But in relation to the first tranche of the call blocking project, um, after eight days, all of the units have been applied for. So again, this is a bit of a timeline there. Uh, the a bit on the applications and the applicants, the average applicant was 75 female and applied for herself. Um, a lot of the time, some of these people had received scam calls, but they are saying that they hadn't lost any money. But we also know that with scam victims, sometimes people say they haven't lost money when they actually have lost money. Um, they were very concerned and one of their worries and their concerns were about losing money in the future. And, and previous studies that we've done with older people groups have said one of the biggest fears of crime is that they are going to be scammed and actually the consequences of that. So it wasn't just about the financial losses, but it's about what would their family think of them? Um, would their family then try and get involved and manage their finances? Would they lose some of their autonomy if that was to be the case, if they were scammed or again admitted that they had been scammed? 61% um, of applications were from people applying for themselves. 26% of applications came from family members, 10% um, were local authorities, um, and 3% were carers and friends. We've had some feedback about the last um, set of call blockers that went out that we um, could have done some more work with partners initially. The problem that we've got is because of um, lockdown and the coronavirus, we were not encouraging installs or encouraging people to go into people's homes. Um, so for us, it was around getting the, the call blockers out to those people that needed them, that were able to self-install. Now, one of the, the arguments, internal arguments we had were actually are we reaching the most vulnerable consumers at this stage which is probably no because the people that are most vulnerable because of their circumstances might not be able to self-install but actually because of the coronavirus covid lockdown 
shielding, we are seeing vulnerability creep up and people's situations and the coronavirus situation is making more people more more vulnerable and more susceptible to fraud and scams. I get at home and I'm ex-directory probably about four scam calls a day, um, which I wasn't at home all day before, so I wasn't getting the call. So because more people are at home, more people are getting the phone calls. Um, some of the statistics and the work that we've done with Steve at True Call said that we saw a lot of the nuisance and scam calls drop off at the beginning of lockdown because people weren't able to access the contact centres or the call centres. Um, but actually, those those figures have started to go back up now. People are going back to work. Um, right. So we did some work on analysis around the effectiveness of units. Um, so it was around obviously the statistics, number of scams or nuisance call received. Um, the blocks, the number of calls blocked, the financial detriment. So the hard, what I would call the hard figures. But we've also done quite a lot of work around the emotional impact on a person's well-being of receiving the scam calls before the installation of the unit and after three months. So these were some of the statistics. I don't need to go through all of them, but they are talking about what the number of calls that people receive. So on average, the unit received 23.5 scams or nuisance calls per month. So these were all been blocked. So those consumers are no longer receiving those. And the Ofcom statistics show that the consumers in the project were receiving significantly more calls than the general population, which just provides us with that additional evidence that actually, even if we aren't getting to the most vulnerable consumers, we're getting to consumers that are receiving more calls than the average person within the UK. Some pretty graphs that one of my team kindly put together for me around the units and actually the number of calls that were received and the calls that were blocked, which is 99% of calls. Uh, this was the this this time around for the call blocking project. Last time we did one, which was the 2015-16 one, um, we did all our own analysis around outcomes and outputs. And um, this time we worked with Bournemouth University to do a specific accredited wellbeing study on consumers, um, so that it could be academically backed to actually see whether the call blockers increased and improved people's wellbeings. And this is what we found. Right. So wellbeing again. Wellbeing. This is the. Uh, the statutory definition of well-being in relation to the CARE Act, it's around um, personal dignity, physical, and mental health and emotional well-being, protection from abuse and neglect, all of the rest on their social economic well-being, personal relationships um, and their individual's contribution to society. Now, well-being is uh, the local authority has a responsibility to try and improve and support well-being of individuals within their care. So every local authority has that duty to do that. Um, so for us to be able to illustrate that actually trading standards can have a really big impact in relation to that work and actually add that value to their local authority was, was something that we really wanted to invest in. So this is some of the feedback that um, consumers gave us at the beginning of the wellbeing study that they felt unhappy, threatened, intimidated, worried, unsafe, helpless. Um, so 181 applicants out of, I think it was 2,000, volunteered in a wellbeing study. So we had 181 applicants, which was a, apparently a very large figure for us to do an academic study. 81% of those were aged 65 or over, 59% were male, 41% were female. 66% of those were living with a partner, um, which is interesting because a lot of the time we see with scam victims that potentially they could be socially isolated or they could be living alone. But 21% of those were living alone, 38% self-identified as vulnerable. And again, that's quite a large figure because generally people do not identify themselves as vulnerable because when you're vulnerable, it's very difficult to recognise your vulnerable situation. 99% um, had received a scam or nuisance call in the six months prior to installation. 10% reported losing money to scam or nuisance calls in the six months prior to installation. The national statistic is that 5% of people report um, report that they have actually lost money to fraud or scams. So actually this was double the figure and actually we probably think it's more than that. But again, the shame element and the fact that people may not be aware they've been scammed because um, sometimes because of the cognitive decline or the clever tactics of the criminals means we think that figure could potentially be higher. And 77% reported being worried about losing money to scams or nuisance calls prior to installation. Right, so we use... Um, it's. That, that acronym at the top, it's the, it's the Edinburgh Warrington uh, Wellbeing Scale. It's a it's a um, accredited wellbeing scale that you can use. And it talks about these are the stats around low, medium, high. So there's certain you ask there's seven key questions that are asked. And then what those consumers do is they 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 aggregate a certain score to each of those questions. And then the score means that they are they are classed as having low, medium or high well-being at the top. 
So these are the questions that were asked. So the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale, which is, I've been feeling optimistic about the future. I've been feeling relaxed. I've been feeling useful. I've been thinking clearly. I've been dealing with problems well. I've been feeling close to other people and I've been able to make up my own mind about things. We use the short scale because the longer scale um, is, is more detailed, lots more questions, but it's things about how loved do they feel? And we weren't sure that, that actually we could apply that to having a call blocker installed. So these were the initial responses. Again, I've got a full report as well that we're looking to publish, which is just in its final stages around all of the detail that's been written up by Bournemouth University that again, I, we can share after this. These were the averages around this. Again, I'll share these at the end of the presentation. And the wellbeing classification after, you'll see that the difference in the green. Again, I didn't put these very jazzy graphs together. I have very clever people in my team who do these things. So where it was low before, where you were looking at just under 40%, the low now is just under 10%. The medium has increased dramatically, and so has the high. So the overall impact on well-being. So these are some of the this. I mean, this is the stuff I like the anecdotal evidence. So whilst we have obviously all of the data to support what we're saying, it's amazing. I was getting so many calls. It was so bad before I was beginning to doubt myself and uncomfortable. And now I feel myself again. It's made a real difference. Enormous effect. Prior to the call blocker, I was getting calls on a regular basis. I lost my husband and this has really helped me feel safer. It's brilliant as my husband doesn't answer scam calls anymore and he used to reply to scammers and we lost money to scams. It's all stopped now. Again, it's not just around well-being. Whilst we measure the well-being of the applicants and the, and the people that are having the blockers, it's also the knock-on effect to the family members as well. I feel a lot happier as I know I won't get any more scam calls. I'm disabled, so getting up to answer each call was a nuisance. Key findings. So before installation, 94% of applicants reported receiving scam or nuisance calls in the previous six months. So three months after installation, 92% of respondents reported not receiving any scams or nuisance calls. And those who did receive, um, did receive significantly less. 93% of self-identified vulnerable respondents were, were worried about losing money in the future. And then after the three months installation of just 17% of all respondents were worried about losing money in the future. Um, the average well-being scores had significantly increased, bringing the sample in line with the general population. So where these people, their well-being had dipped so low around getting the scam calls, actually by installing the call blocker, the evidence shows, and it's a direct line, that actually by installing the true call devices, we have brought that those, those consumers' well-being up to that of the national average. Um, it also shows that... Um, the, those consumers that were identified as being more vulnerable because of their circumstances, it had a greater impact on those people and their well-being, um, which for us is it shows that actually if we can get these devices out to those consumers that are most vulnerable because of their circumstances, we will be making the most difference to those consumers' well-being. So recommendations from the study. There should be greater recognition of the impact that scams and nuisance calls have on well-being, regardless of whether it's act to engagement or any financial loss. Um, all regular landline users are likely to benefit from call blocking technology. Um, we are doing some work with the with the telco providers at the moment to try and bring in a charter similar to what we did with the mail providers to see whether we can get a, a consistent blocking across the network, but also getting the networks to provide um, the, the big telco providers to support one another and actually share what they're doing in this space. And also to go out with consistent messaging like Friends Against Scams or Take Five, because again, they are the front line to be able to provide key advice and education messages to their customer base, which is millions and millions of people. Um, call blockers, number three, call blockers should be made available to vulnerable individuals to support them to live independently. For older people, those who self-identify as vulnerable and individuals who live alone are most likely to benefit from the installation of a call blocker. And building on the previous work of the NTS scams team, um, further signposting would help provide clear guidance regarding the application for the um, and the potential benefits of installing a call blocker. I'm just going to move this thing here. That is the end of my presentation. Has anybody got any questions?
Any questions, any comments? I can only see Steve at the minute. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Um, I'll happily, as I said to Corinne, I will share the um, presentation after the event. Corinne's got it already. Glenys. Just a very good presentation. Sorry, my washing machine's going into its final spin. Here. So is mine. Mine's <laughs> vivid in the background. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was for the first uh, COVID during COVID I was working at a humanitarian access centre where we were organising as co-manager organising um, social uh, contact phone calls to people on their own as well as food parcels and uh, prescription pickups and deliveries and I tell you that brought home to me how lonely and vulnerable people are if I'd never thought before that you know during that period of time um they were so grateful a lot of people just to get that phone call even from us just to organize a social contact phone so i can well understand now i think that brought home to me how vulnerable people are they were basically desperate to speak to anybody that would give them reassurance um you know of any kind and i, I got life stories from people you know and it was just incredible some of them are fantastic you know um people that you would never meet in a million years in normal life you know um great great stories but it was always coming across to me saying well I'm from the council you know they've identified and they know me from the council because I'm phoning them every week but you know it'd be so so easy just to scam people like that you know I think that's yeah. that's what's so so soul destroying really you know right. you, you come across that I think what we've seen is um, obviously with lockdown and I'm, but I'll be quite honest, I don't think my mental health has probably been the best during lockdown. I feel very trapped in my house and trapped by my children. So actually um, for people that are, uh, that their social contact is going out to the shops or for um, having uh, someone deliver their shopping or any of those things, I think where people were socially isolated or lonely before, I think it's just been completely and utterly exacerbated. Add the fear of getting coronavirus um, and actually all the fake news and all of the stuff that happened very at the beginning of lockdown as well. Um, we were seeing people being really exploited by coronavirus. We saw one um, contact centre bringing people 100 there was 170,000 calls recorded via the call blocking devices with Steve who gathered the intel with us around this who were targeting uh, consumers on who had call blockers so vulnerable because of their circumstances already um, and they were being targeted to buy PPE and hand sanitizer that never materialized for 14 up between 29.99 and 49.99 it worked out something there was a, an 8% 8% of those people were responding so it was something like a, a 6 million pound loss within a four week period and they were just repeatedly targeting targeting phoning these people like some of them were getting calls 10 times a day to sell them this stuff which was fear tactics like if you don't get it we're running out there isn't enough of it there isn't enough of it you need to make sure that you've got hand sanitizer and PPE you won't be able to get out of your house we saw fake driveway cleansing services fake shopping services um, and those things aren't going away we, where I think there's maybe less urgency because of people's increased um, anxiety and mental health it's much easier to push people into a hot state and to make them make unwise decisions much easier i bought some stuff during lockdown that i'm never going to use to entertain my children because i got in a panic that they were going to be bored and drive me mad well i created a whole craft cupboard of stuff that i'm probably never going to use so if it's actually if you're in a situation where you're already vulnerable because of your circumstances that panic it makes it so much easier for the criminals to befriend you groom you target you and push you into a situation where you make those decisions that you may not have made before Any more questions from anyone? My team are all on here as well. Team, have I missed anything out? Do I did I need to add anything additional? No, I don't think so, Lou. I think you covered it all off. And like you said, that the full report um, when it's made available, which it will be shortly, will cover off in more detail for those people that want to fully engage and see exactly how the study was undertaken. It's quite an interesting read, so. Yeah. 
Thank you, Saif. And um, we're also trying to work up a strategy about how we can get some more um, traction in relation to wellbeing because um, it, it touches on lots of different government departments. We're working with the DCMS at the moment around funding. There is no more funding for this year, but potentially as part of the spending review, we may get some funding. Um, we may get some funding for the next three years. So we're working with the DCMS on that. Um, and we're also trying to work out how we can um, push this wellbeing data into the, the Department of Health. Um, and the other government departments that there will be a knock on effect for and actually illustrate what a, what a key role trading standards has like earlier as you said about the fact that you go and talk to people but what a key role we have as a profession around increasing and improving people's well-being um, and actually trying to whilst we've proved that people that are scammed um, the, the mental health effects and the detrimental effects it can have on people's physical health as well as financial losses is massive. There's more for us to do there. And actually, just the fear of being scammed is ginormous and, it, and, and something that we really need to raise the profile of as well. Any more for any more? No? Marvellous. I'm just going to um, just interject here slightly. Um, I don't know whether any, any of you seen, I was just talking to Steve and Glenis before um, everybody else came on. We've got um, a mind session running at um, 11.30 that's going, um, that's been put on via Zoom. Um, so if anybody wanted to join in, then feel free. Um, our website's currently um, just crashed. But the uh, <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> anyway, but the link's up on Twitter, so you can join that way if you haven't managed to get on. Um, so yes, anyway, do do join because I'm now worried that nobody else is going to be able to get on to it. <laughs> Marvelous, oh, winning! <laughs> yes, virtual symposium uh, win. It's there, back, Corinne. It's back. It's back. It was down for two minutes. It's back. Woohoo! Right. Um, yeah, so by all means, as I say, it's a, a three minutes time. It's a session on um, managing stress um, from mind. And obviously that links in with the well-being stuff that you're talking about. And there might be some tips and tricks that you can pass on to people um, in the stuff that you do, that you guys at Friends uh, Against Scams do. Anyway, I'll leave you be. Um, if your report is out um, soonish, um, then I'm more than happy to feature it on alongside your video um, as and when but obviously the content comes down on the 5th of november so if it's if, if it's in good time before that then obviously i will happily um publish it up there as well so that people can pick that up too lovely and if people want to email me don't like as well that we don't get it it's, it's nearly ready but if it's not i can email it it'll be emailed out anyway perfect right. okay thank, thank you thank you, thank you all have a lovely weekends <laughs>